Thank you. You guys look a little bit stoned. Why don't you just turn to someone and say, you need to be baptized. <laughs> uh, there we go. That's how we do it. We just pressurize people. You know, we have a, a, a black church just on the road. It's called Discovery, and uh, they are a family of olive tree. And last night I was at a conference, and they are cranking. That church is flying. It is, so, it is just doing so well. And so I want you to keep praying for them, and uh, we'll be supporting them. I am praying that they literally take over DUT. That's what I'm, I'm praying. They're growing nicely. It's wonderful. So that's cool. But let me get into the message. So I have a, a mate. Um, He's a cross between a Neanderthal and a very big human. I'm not quite sure. He's, he's one of those guys who can <clears throat> like bench press 65 kgs on each side with dumbbells. And, um, and anyway, he runs a gym and he's an MMA fighter. And if I wasn't such good friends with him, I'd be really scared of him. In fact, when you look at him, you, you kind of think, I think he could kill me with that jaw. Like that's the kind of guy uh, that I'm, I'm talking about. So... A little while ago, I was thinking to myself, I am pretty skinny at the moment. I'm getting these little niggles, like little aches and pains, which I'm pretending aren't because of age. And, and so I, I thought to myself, I need to put on a little bit of weight, just a little bit of muscle, not a lot, like five kgs. So I said to him, I said, how do I put on five kgs? Because I have tried my whole life to put on kgs and it just doesn't happen. I just stay the same. I know, woman, you hate me, but just, it just kind of stays the same. And, and just, ladies, just imagine, for a guy, you want to get a little bit bigger and a little bit stronger. For ladies, you, you might not. But I just wanted to, like, get a little bit of muscle. And so I said to him, how do I do this? So he said, no, it's easy. Then he goes, you just need to eat seven eggs a day, have three protein shakes. And then he says, these things called peptides. You just shoot one into this arm and one into this arm in the beginning of the day before you, you, you train. And then in the afternoon, oh, and you need to train every day. And the, off, and the next day, you shoot them into your bum. And then, and what happens? But a few months, you'll be, you'll be 85. And I had this thought. 78 is just great. <laughs> You see, if you've ever been to gym or you've got a gym bony friend, in fact, upstairs in the 10 a.m., they're like five oaks. They weigh the same as all of you. They, they come in. If you know those kind of people, you often look at them and go, Flip, that's amazing. It's inspiring. Just looking at you is inspiring. But that is not for me. The same thing happens in Christianity. You see, we look at some people, like Estelle, she comes up, and you can tell, like, she's just spiritual, like, you just feel, and you look at her, and she goes, I don't know how she's a spiritual ninja. She probably prays all day. Does she even have a job? <laughs> she actually runs a business, by the way. And you think to yourself, that's amazing for her. Just not me. And what happens, because we believe that something is so far away, is we disqualify ourselves from it. And today I want to speak about something that's weird. It's a weird title. I want to talk about the fight to enjoy God. The fight to enjoy God. Now some of you are sitting here and you're logical and you're going like, how do you, why would you ever need to fight to enjoy something? Because there are some things that you fought through when you had the first drink of wine and the second, and the third, and you kept fighting, and now, hmm, man, it's good. There's some things that you've got to fight through. And there are going to be some people here, you're going to listen to this, and you're going to go, oh, I don't have to fight to enjoy God. I'm just, I just enjoy God all the time. Mm -hmm. It's coming. And there's some of you who, who are going, I have never enjoyed God in my life. What on earth are you do talking about fight to enjoy God? And I want to help you know how to enjoy God today. And there are most of us who go, yeah, that's probably me. I need to learn. And so I'm going to talk about this. And I'm going to give you a chunk of geek you out theology. And then I'm going to get really practical. And then we're going to sing a song at the end. Okay. So in Genesis 2 verse 4, it says this. This is the account, the account 
of the heavens and the earth when they were created, when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Now no shrub had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant had yet sprung up. For the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth. There was no one to work the ground. Just, there's a moment in there. The Lord hadn't sent anything because there's no one to work it. Some of us are wondering why God isn't doing anything because there's no one putting up their hand to work it. And then it says, <clears throat> but streams came up from within the earth and watered the surface of the ground. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. Now a couple of weeks ago, Shevian opened up this series and he said, God came to Eden. They didn't even change the name. It's a Hebrew name that means paradise. And God so wanted to be with man that he set a garden and he made it so that Adam would be able to connect with him. He chose a place. And Adam turned away from God, so God made a tent. And God would walk around in the tent. And then every now and again, man would turn away from God. And then God would draw them back and they'd go back to the tent. And then eventually that didn't work, so God went, okay, David, build a temple. And David builds a temple, a building. And God would come to dwell with man in the temple. And that kept going, kept going, but it wasn't good enough for God, so God sent Jesus. And Jesus became the dwelling place of God with man. And everybody could connect with Jesus. But that wasn't enough for God. Because he could only meet with so many people at a time. And so he went to the cross so that we could become the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, that whole story is called temple theology. And um, when you read the Bible, so this is maybe for those who've been Christians for a little while, there are different ways to read the Bible. So there's, there's a way some people read the Bible, it's called Reformed theology. The, the way you read the Bible is you go, there was a creation, there was a fall, Jesus came to redeem us, and now he's renewing us by the Holy Spirit. That's called a Reformed lens. There is a lens called a kingdom lens. The kingdom lens is you read the Bible, and everywhere you look in the Bible, you're looking for Jesus the king. And when you read the Old Testament, you realize that it's a context, a setup for Jesus to come as king. And everything Jesus pre preaches about, the thing he preaches about the most is the kingdom of God. And we know that he will be king when he comes back, above all rulers and authorities and reigns. That's kingdom lens, and we would have that. Another way of reading the Bible is called Trinitarian. Trinitarian lens is this that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And Jesus comes to show us the Father. The whole thing is about the Father. How do I bring you to the Father? And when we think about the Bible, we're thinking Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we're thinking family. And God reconciles us. He adopts us into his family because he's always wanted you to be family. This is reading it through a Trinitarian lens. lens. And when you read about the Trinity, they're always boasting about each other. Jesus is going, my dad's the best. And the father's going, no, 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 my boy, he is the best. The Holy Spirit's going, man, I, I just want to tell you about Jesus. He is a rock star. And Jesus is going, I got to go. Because the Holy Spirit, when he comes, he is, he is the best. And we look at the Trinity, and when you read the Bible that way, you go, man, God just wants family. And he wants to bring me back. And none of these lenses are wrong. But when I speak about enjoying God, I talk about temple theology. And so I'm going to geek you out, and I'm fine with that. You'll just yawn, and then you'll come to the point, and then you'll cry, and then you'll praise God. When you want to really go deep with God, you need to understand this temple picture. Now, last year, lots of you went there, but I spoke about Eden as a temple. And what I said, I think we've got some pictures to keep you awake. That's not Eden? Oh, that's Eden. In the Garden of Eden, or in Eden, there were three places. There was Eden itself. There was the Holy of Holies. And out of the Holy of Holies, if you went a little bit further, you would have 
the holy place. And then if you went a little bit further, you would have the outer court. The temples always looked the same. This is the architecture of God. There was like this holy, holy place, and then there was a little outer court, and then you'd go a little bit into the outer regions of the world. And in the holy place, there was a priest. His name was Adam. He was instructed to tend and keep the garden. The Hebrew words for those are the same words given to a priest. You're to tend or serve and keep and guard the temple. Adam was the first high priest. He was there to minister before God and grow the temple. There was a, a tree of life. And if you went into the temple, there was this little candelabra thing that was shaped like a tree. And it was supposed to bring life. When, when Adam got kicked out, there were these cherubim. These dudes kept Adam from coming back in. They had fire. You know what they had on the top of the mercy seat in the temple was cherubim. You know what God's doing? He's going, when I did it then, it was the same as I'm doing now. And it's going to be the same I'm doing the whole way through because there's a temple in heaven that I'm going to superimpose on earth so that you understand it. And when Jesus comes, and one day he gets up, and he's standing next to this beautiful temple. Show me that beautiful temple, next, the one you had before. He's standing next to that. Now, that's kind of impressive nowadays. Imagine 2,000 years ago. You stand next to that, you're just like, yo. And so Jesus says, destroy this temple, and I will rebuild it in three days. And the Jews go, it took us 46 years, dude. Do you know how heavy these rocks are? And then the writers of the New Testament go, but he wasn't talking about the building. He was talking about his body. Now, here's the big idea. If you really want to enjoy God, if you're serious about your faith, the more you understand about the temple, the more you understand about Jesus. And the more you understand about Jesus, the more you understand that when Peter says, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit, and when Paul says, you individually are the temple of the Holy Spirit, the more you'll understand that from the very, very beginning, God's entire plan has been to dwell in you. He has been chasing after you to dwell in and with you. Now, Holy Spirit, I pray, even as I speak, I pray that people will literally feel your presence chasing their hearts. See, this is why this is so important, because when I was a non-Christian and I came to other churches, I, until I had this moment when I felt God chasing me, that was the moment everything changed. It, it, something shifts when you feel the presence of God beginning to chase you. And my prayer today is that some of you, some of you shockers who got chased to church because you messed something up very badly. You guys, I love you guys. I love chasing you. I'm like the scary little oak who just comes. I'm praying that God touches you powerfully today. Okay, now you're not asleep yet, huh? I can go like a little bit deeper and then, and then get practical. Out of, the, out of the temple in Eden, it says... The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. And in the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And a river watering the garden flowed from Eden. From there, it was separated into four head waters. So here's what God does. He puts the garden, but he puts a river right from his presence out. The purpose of the river is to supply the needs of Adam so that he can extend the garden. You don't have any water, you can't make the garden grow. You need resources. This principle works the whole way through the Bible. Whatever God asks you to do, he gives you resources for. There is always a river. Now, you Christians have been here for, you've been in church for a long time. Uh, there, there some of you have been in church longer than I've been alive. There is a, you'll remember this, there is this, in, in Ezekiel 47, there's this prophecy where 
where the angel asks Ezekiel to walk into the river. Remember this? You probably sang songs. And then went, the water went up to his ankles. And then he says, come a little deeper. Goes up to his knees. And then he says, come a little bit deeper. And goes into the waist. And then he says, come a little deeper. And then Ezekiel says, it was so deep, no man could cross it. What he's talking about. You, anyone remember that? All two of you. <laughs> what he's talking about is a river that flowed out of the temple. Now, let me tell you why this all matters. So the other day, I'm sitting with my little girl. And we do Bible study every now and again. I wish it was more now than then. But we, we do Bible school and study. And whenever we do Bible study, my desire is to make the Bible come alive. Because the Bible's the greatest gift I can give my kids. So I better not make it boring. So I open up, and I'm reading from John chapter 4. In John chapter 4, Jesus comes to a well. And he's waiting there. It's lunchtime. And I'm reading to him, and I'm starting to explain. I said, Jesus is waiting because God told him to wait. And then a girl comes. Now, you've got to understand, in those days, nobody ever went to a well at lunchtime. You only go to the well when it's cool in the morning or cool in the evening because it's hard work carrying water. But this lady comes at lunchtime. And she's not a Jew. She's a Samaritan. And it's like apartheid. They hated each other. And, but this girl, she comes at lunchtime and Jesus starts talking to her. And Jesus says to her, will you give me a drink of water? And my girl's like, okay, dad, get to the point. And, I say, and she says, but I'm a Samaritan, you're a Jew. Why would I help you, basically? She's, she's actually quite cocky. And uh, she's a little bit funny, actually. She's sarcastic to Jesus. And so Jesus said, if you knew who was asking you, you'd be asking me for living water. So then she changes the subject. She's like, ah, this guy. And she goes, what about, you Oaks think we must worship there, but we think we must worship here. And he goes, he just brings us back. He says, no, in time, you will worship in spirit and in truth. And every time she tries to sneak off, he just goes after her. Jesus is horrible like that. He, just, he won't let you run away. And then he says, why don't you go call your husband? And I mean, this is a dirty trick. Because Jesus has a word of knowledge about what's been going on in her life. And she goes, I don't have a husband. And Jesus says, you're right. You've had five. And the man you're living with now isn't your husband. And I told her that. And I just began to weep. Not ugly cry, dignified cry. <laughs> but I just began to cry. Because she's been taken in and tossed out and 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 taken in and tossed out. And now she's been given, she's given up for being taken in. So she's just abiding with. And the reason she's abiding with is because in those days the Syrians ran the country for Rome. And the Syrians would rape and brutalize any woman on her own. And generally, if you're a woman on your own, you would go into poverty, so you'd probably land up in prostitution. And she's just found something that works for now. And Jesus says to her, I've got living water. And as I'm telling her the story, I know that I have been that woman who feels like, I'm taken in and then rejected and then taken in and rejected and then I try this and it doesn't work and I, I have felt that pain and I'm telling you the story and I'm so identifying with a woman but I've also felt the living water that when it touches your soul, it brings life to dead things. Yeah. It's like the temple in Ezekiel. It flows into the Dead Sea. Can I show you a picture of the Dead Sea? Here's, here's a Dead Sea. Tom, you got a Dead Sea for me. That's the Dead Sea. You, you know why it's nice and colored like that? Because it's eight times as salty as the sea. Because nothing flows out. Her soul is like the Dead Sea. And the water from the temple 
Ezekiel sees flows into the Dead Sea and it washes away the salt and fish start living and trees start abiding. And as I'm telling her this story, I'm starting to think about how much Dead Sea stuff there has been in this heart and how God has brought life to it and the river has restored. And I'm thinking about how many times that river has provided life, trees, Joy, righteousness, peace. How many times that that river has restored aspects and then given power? And how many times I've prayed for people and they've fallen over or deliverance has happened or healing has happened and I've accessed the river of God and it's brought life to people around me or how I've gone into meetings that were going completely pear and then I've gone, Holy Spirit, you gotta help and everybody got peaceful. You've gotta understand there is a river The reason you have to enjoy God is there is a river. And the river is for you. But, but, there's another tree in the garden. It's called the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And if you looked at that tree, you would look at that fruit and go, that is like Woolies triple decker chocolate dessert. Yo, oh, it looks good. And, and if, you, if you heard, see, there was another problem. There was this tree that was beautiful and looked delicious. But there was Satan, too. And Satan pops along. You know what Satan does? Because he does this to you, too. So this is relevant. Satan comes along, and he just goes, look at the tree. Look at your self-sufficiency. Look at the thing that can make you like, and the word that's used, sometimes it's translated like God, it's not actually right. It's it's Elohim, not El. El would be the most high God. Elohim is like like an angel, like a son of God, like a spiritual being that is very powerful. What he's saying is, look at the tree. Man, looks good, eh? You know what, if you get that tree, it will make you like a supernatural bling thing. (laughs) You will not need a thing. You will get all you need out of that thing. It will be like, man, if you take that, you will be sorted. It will be like you have a borehole and solar and more money than you can imagine, and you've got enough to put your kids through private school, send them to Stellenbosch, set them up afterwards so they can lurk with you for two years, and you are still sorted. That tree, man, it will give you everything you need. You know what, if you're single, you take from that tree, you will get words, you will charm the offer. If you've got that tree, Career-wise, you'll just go promotion to promotion to promotion. I I know none of you have this tree in your life. You know how you know whether this tree is alive and well in you? Just compare how much you pray about things to how much you strategize, mark a plan, think about, focus on. See, there's a fight that happens every single day in my life. Because I have a Satan, and sometimes it's just me, who's going, man, imagine I could just solve that issue. Or you get into relational conflict and you just go, imagine I'd said that when they said that, and then after that, they probably would have said that. Then imagine I said that to them. That would have shut them down. And then you start playing it over. and You know that thing. Or imagine I just made enough. little side hustle here. Because then I would. I have that inside of me. Just like you do. And so, here's how it works. Satan comes and he has three weapons on your life. He has the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. He has three things that he will work in you. And you have one thing to fight him back with, enjoying God. 
It is so important that the early church father said the purpose of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. You have one weapon against it. And so, here's what I realized. Every day, I need to say to myself, the thing I need to value most today is not financial. It's not more than enough to pay all the bills. It's flows from God's presence. It's the river of righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. It's the blood of Jesus that is more valuable than silver and gold. My value system has to shift. And the thing I need to do most is not my emails, WhatsApps, and organize and push. The thing that I need to do most is be connected to the vine because outside of him, I can do nothing. I do this pretty much every day in different ways. The thing I need to fear the most is not living in Durban and KZN collapsing. It's God and missing out on his plan for my life. The thing that will fill my cup the most, this is the biggest fight for me, is not the kite surfing, although it's close. (laughs) It's not touch rugby. It's not sport with my mates. It's the voice of God giving me direction. You see, we're going to sing so the worship guys can come up. I have to fight this fight every day. I have a fight to enjoy God. And I have to fight the pull. And friends, I counsel too many of you to know that you aren't in a fight with a pull. A powerful pull that is talking to you about careers and where you should live and what you should do and all of those kind of things. And if you don't learn how to start with, my value system is a new God, my sustenance is a new God, my river is a new God, you will spend the rest of your day catching up and being looking at the tree. But there's a river for you. Now we're going to sing one more song. How many of you have never felt the presence of God? Just go like this. Anybody never felt the presence of God? One half brave person. A lot of people don't understand the mechanics behind it. The mechanics of experiencing the presence of God is this word called faith. If you are in a dry spot, what it actually means is your faith is wavering. That's why, how many of you connect with God just through worship? You sing, you connect with God. That's the way I connect with God. How many of you connect with God just through the word? I just want to tell you what's going on. Those people who sing, they connect with God, you have faith that God's going to meet you when you connect with, when you start singing. Those people who read the word, you have faith that when I read the word, God's going to meet with me. Some of you, you pray, you have faith that when you pray, The thing that brings you into the presence of God is faith. And this is the faith you should have. He's holy, but Jesus made me righteous. He's a father, but through Jesus I'm adopted. He is perfect, but through Jesus I was a slave, but I've been bought. He has done everything. Jesus has done everything to bring me into the presence of God. There is nothing that separates me from the love of God. His righteousness, he's put on me. Family, that's who I am. And so when I come to God, I don't come hoping. I boldly come into the throne room of God. And I expect that my God who literally went to a cross to dwell with man, wants to meet with me more than I want to meet with him. Now we're going to sing a song. And the whole point of my prayer, uh, my whole sermon, I know it was long, is that the river would flow in your life today. I I want it to flow. You need the river more than you need the other stuff. You need the river. He has what you need. And you need it more in Durban than you do in Cape Town. (laughs) 
Some people haven't asked Jesus into your life. You've got to know he's done what you need. Ask him in now. So we're going to stand. I'm going to sing a song. And I'm trusting God to move powerfully.
we're going to have some people praying at the front for you. If you, are, if you need a touch from God, I really encourage you to come up. If you need to go, why don't you just put our hands like this. Jesus, today, I ask that your river will flow from the depths of my spirit. And I ask that I will be different today. In the power of Jesus' name, amen. May God bless you. Have a great day.